The story begins in the heart of Hangzhou, a notable city situated within China's economic powerhouse, the Yangtze River Delta region. Known for its breathtaking natural landscapes, historical richness, and modern urban evolution, Hangzhou is considered the gem of this thriving region. The city attracts countless visitors worldwide every year, and it's also the birthplace of the famous Chinese entrepreneur Jack Ma, whose innovative platforms Alipay and Taobao have dramatically shifted the Chinese people's consumption habits. As a young boy, Jack Ma would often hone his English skills at West Lake, Hangzhou's most famous attraction. It was at this location where he encountered Ken Morley, an Australian who would play a crucial role in his life. Despite Ma's humble origins, Morley was captivated by the thin boy's learning enthusiasm, which led to a deep friendship. At the age of 21, Ma was invited to Australia by Morley. This trip revealed the stark economic disparities between the two countries, leaving a profound impact on Ma. Morley, later on, provided Ma with the capital to start his business and continuous encouragement. Their story is quite a legend. Should you wish to know more, feel free to leave a comment, and I will expand on this in a detailed introduction. Okay, back to our story. Nestled within a residential area in Hangzhou City lived a middle-aged couple and their 12-year-old daughter. Their peaceful existence was shattered in July 2020 when the wife, Lai Huili, inexplicably disappeared. On July 6, 2020, Lai's husband, Xu Guoli, and her daughter from a previous marriage, Yu Fang, reported her sudden disappearance to the local police station, stating they hadn't seen Lai for two days. The first one to realize that something was amiss was Lai's husband, Xu Guoli. On July 5th, a quiet Sunday, Lai remained absent throughout the day without any contact. When she didn't return home even at night, alarm bells began to ring. It was only when her supervisor noticed her absence at work the following Monday afternoon and reached out to Xu that he fully comprehended the severity of the situation. He immediately contacted his stepdaughter, only to find out she hadn't heard from her mother either. Given Lai's uncomplicated routine centered around work and home, it was apparent something was gravely wrong. Consequently, Zhu, accompanied by his stepdaughter, reported Lai's disappearance to the local police at 8.07 p.m. The missing person was none other than Lai Huili, a 53-year-old woman who had grown up in a small village at the heart of Hangzhou City. Her former home lay just beyond a canal from her current residence. She was the youngest and most attractive of three siblings and lived a plain and simple life over there. In her youth, her village was yet to face demolition and was situated near a poultry market, making it a popular destination for migrant workers seeking affordable accommodations. Thus, residents capitalized on this opportunity and started renting out their houses for additional income. It's crucial to highlight that two decades ago, Chinese cities were relatively small with numerous villages scattered around or even within the city limits. These villages mainly consisted of bungalows, snaking narrow roads, and inadequate sanitation. For the sake of future urban planning and development, these villages were often demolished, and the residents relocated to newly built apartments. The original sites would be repurposed for wider roads, towering buildings, markets, and parks. The government and developers would offer compensation for the lost property and fund new apartments for the displaced homeowners. This transition often yielded significant windfalls for the displaced households, transforming many impoverished farmers into overnight millionaires, a common phenomenon in China over the past two decades. However, it also spawned numerous disputes and tragedies stemming from unjust compensation. Lai's life took an interesting turn when she began renting out spare rooms for extra income. One of her tenants was a charismatic young man named Xu Guoli, Freshly retired from the military and running a feed business with his friends, Xu, with his good looks and eloquence, soon captured Lai's heart. The 56-year-old man, originally from Shaoxing City, Zhejiang Province, had a modest upbringing. His parents, who were farmers, had adopted a boy due to their inability to conceive. However, fortune smiled upon them, 
and they had two more boys, Shu being the middle one. Sadly, when Shu was just four, his mother passed away, plunging the family into dire straits. Despite Lai's growing affection, their relationship faced strong disapproval from their families, primarily due to Shu's less privileged background. Lai's family, in contrast, enjoyed relative financial comfort, owning a house set for demolition and hence entitled to substantial compensation. After initially resisting, Lai ultimately gave in to family pressure and parted ways with Shu. In due course, Lai's mother arranged her marriage to Yu Huilin, a man from a neighboring village with better financial standing. Shortly afterward, Shu also married a woman from his hometown and moved to Shanghai. It appeared their love story had met an abrupt end. However, life post-breakup was reasonably comfortable for both. Lai adapted well to her new life with her husband and in-laws, and at 24, she welcomed a daughter. Her husband, a man of few words, was a diligent worker and an adept welder. He was respectful and always deferred to his wife. Despite the awaited windfall from the impending house demolition, Lai's husband earned a decent income. However, it was Lai who was the decision maker, even managing the family finances. She held a position of authority, with even her in-laws showing her due respect. Shu's life was quite challenging. After moving to Shanghai in 1996, he and his friends started a feed business. With limited capital, every penny they earned was hard fought. In 2000, after amassing some capital, Shu ventured into duck farming, which proved to be a demanding period, leaving him little time to manage his family affairs. Consequently, his wife assumed the role of a full-time housewife, looking after their son. Everyone knew Shu to be a hard-working man with a devoted wife at home. In 2004, Shu found himself in the limelight when he appeared in an interview about the bird flu epidemic, offering advice to fellow duck farmers. His passionate and systematic guidance on compensation policies turned him into a local hero among the farming community. However, that same year, an outbreak of bird flu dealt a devastating blow to his duck business, bringing him to the brink of bankruptcy. During a business trip to Hangzhou with his friends, he chanced upon Lai Huili. This unexpected reunion after many years filled both with surprise and delight, and they exchanged phone numbers. When his business was teetering on the edge, Zhu turned to Lai for financial help. Even though they were both married, Lai didn't reject him. Perhaps the sweet memories of their first love were still alive in her heart, or perhaps her solid financial situation made her feel she could support the man she once deeply loved. At this time, Lai's house had been demolished by the government, and she had received a significant amount of money as compensation. She was in charge of her family's finances, which allowed her to lend a hand to Shu. Her support helped Shu's business recover, and he made a substantial profit due to rising duck prices. Following this, the two began to see each other more, and Lai even boldly left her husband to move in with Shu in Shanghai. Their living together didn't stay a secret for long, and Shu's ex-wife, Miss Guan, found out. In order to protect her family, she confronted Lai, leading to a fight. Shu was there at the time, but didn't defend his ex-wife. Instead, he sided with Lai. This caused their relationship to crumble, but Miss Guan was hesitant to divorce as she wanted to keep her family intact for their child. However, Shu threatened her, saying that if she didn't agree to the divorce, her life would be in danger. This scared Miss Guan, who for the first time saw a fierce and cruel side to her husband, so she decided to let him go. As for this situation, Zhu's relatives stated, Though Miss Guan was attractive and had a pleasant personality, her poor family background meant she couldn't assist Zhu in his business. Lai, however, was also attractive and had a good personality and her family was wealthy. She not only lent money to Shu, but also helped him rejuvenate his business. After finalizing his divorce, Shu was finally able to marry Lai. She faced resistance from her ex-husband and her parents, but was determined to get a divorce. She even threatened to waste all their money and rack up debts if her husband didn't agree to the divorce. Left with no choice, her husband finally agreed, 
and in 2008, Lai and Shu got married. A little while later, they had a daughter, their own little bundle of joy. Two years into their marriage, in 2010, Shu's duck farm in Shanghai was demolished, and the couple received over a million yuan in compensation. In 2014, Lai's village was also demolished, and the couple received additional compensation, including a large sum of money and two new apartments. Their life was comfortable and had improved, and those who had initially disapproved of their relationship, including Lai's parents and relatives, fell silent. Fast forward to July 6, 2020, the police received a report about Lai's disappearance and began their routine investigation. The community where Lai and Shu lived had a comprehensive security system, so the police looked at the CCTV records. Shockingly, the last footage of Lai was from July 4th, when she was seen returning home with her daughter and a birthday cake. From that point until the police received the report, there was no sign of Lai in the CCTV footage. The question then arose, did Lai leave the community? And if so, where did she go? After several days of investigation, the police had yet to uncover any clues regarding Lai's whereabouts. This left Lai's family increasingly worried. In an attempt to expedite the investigation, Lai's nephew, Mr. Mao, reached out to the media. He contacted a television station, hoping their coverage might generate new leads. Below is the interview conducted during that time. Shamadomi the disappearance of Lai, an ordinary woman, quickly gained public attention when her husband, Shu, appeared in a televised interview. Shu was notably calm and chatty, showing little distress or sorrow over Lai's disappearance. He even suggested that Lai might have run away with a lover, remarking, She couldn't have gone out alone. Considering her intellect, she wouldn't have left on her own. Honestly, this is based on my understanding of her after living together for so many years. Ten days after Lai vanished, the police were still empty-handed. However, several suspicious aspects of the case led them to revisit the surveillance footage from their community. After thoroughly analyzing 6,000 hours of video, they made a shocking discovery. Lai had not left the apartment building after returning home with her daughter on the evening of July 4th. The police then initiated a thorough search throughout the community, sparing no effort. They conducted interviews with over a thousand households, collecting details about Lai's daily routines, relationships, and financial circumstances. Despite their efforts, Lai remained unaccounted for, and the possibilities of her running away or being abducted seemed increasingly unlikely. Consequently, the gaze of suspicion began to focus on her husband, Shu. During the investigation, Shu demonstrated proactive involvement, he composed a missing person notice, offering a generous reward exceeding 100,000 yuan for any leads about his wife. Moreover, he disclosed a divorce agreement, which added fuel to the speculation of a potential affair. This triggered intense debates on social media, with many pointing fingers at Shu. Some even proposed a more sinister scenario, that Lai might have been murdered and her body disposed of. In response to these suspicions, the police examined the water usage in Shu's home and discovered an alarming detail. Over two tons of water were consumed on the day of Lai's disappearance, possibly to clean up the traces of a crime. On July 22nd, the police decided to inspect the community's landscape river and septic tank. It was a blistering day in Hangzhou, with temperatures hitting 40 degrees Celsius. Regardless of the oppressive heat and repulsive odor, the police managed to extract multiple loads of waste from the septic tank. The community, housing over 3,000 residents, had accumulated an immense amount of waste over the past two weeks. 
This made the task of locating any trace of lye in the accumulated waste seem as daunting as finding a needle in a haystack. Additionally, any human tissues that might have been present were likely to have decomposed in such unsanitary conditions. However, the police had no other options. After hours of extracting, washing, and sifting through the waste, they eventually discovered suspected human tissues. These were sent for DNA matching, which confirmed that the tissues belonged to Lai. Following the release of the test report, the police interrogated Mr. Xu. After nine hours of intense questioning, Xu Guoli finally confessed to murdering Lai Huili. During the police interrogation, Xu Guoli shed light on the sequence of events and the motive behind Lai Huili's murder. The couple had a prosperous start to their marital life, accruing wealth through their previous duck farming venture. In 2009, they received considerable compensation of a million yuan, approximately 200,000 US dollars, for the demolition of their duck farm. For the period, this was a substantial sum in China. Known for his generosity, Xu Guoli lent a significant amount to his friends in their times of need. However, the repayment of this money was sporadic and extended over five years. In 2014, the couple invested a major part of their savings in a friend's real estate project, hoping to reap a substantial profit from it. In the summer of 2015, the son from Xu's previous marriage was accepted into a university in Hangzhou. Xu's ex-wife, who had never remarried and raised her son single-handedly, received Xu's promise of financial aid once his situation improved. Upon learning about this, Lai agreed to support the education of Xu's son in Hangzhou. Early in their marriage, Lai had suggested that they could provide her stepson with a residence once they were financially stable. They resided in a 55-square-meter apartment, a resettlement compensation for the demolition of Lai's bungalow in her hometown. Another 110-square-meter apartment was still under construction. The couple planned to give the smaller apartment to Xu's son once the larger one was ready, a plan to which Lai agreed. The couple's financial circumstances took a turn for the worse when their real estate investment failed due to policy and management issues. In response, they returned to the workforce, with Lai securing a job as a cleaner in an accounting company and Xu taking up a role as a truck driver. However, Xu was not content with a modest life and yearned for a financial recovery. He decided to venture into stock trading, a subject he had self-studied. However, he needed capital to invest in stocks and borrowed money from Lai, who trusted him and gave him their demolition compensation. The stock market, however, proved to be as unpredictable as a lottery. Xu's foray into the stock market ended in failure. He didn't make any profit, instead losing a total of 1.6 million yuan, equivalent to 200,000 US dollars. The huge financial loss weighed heavily on Lai. Every day was filled with complaints and growing worries. At one point, she even contemplated divorce. The couple's once strong relationship began to fray due to the husband's failure in stock trading. Lai once expressed, with so many savings in my account, my daughter and I can live a comfortable life without him. By the start of 2020, their new 110 square meter resettlement apartment was ready. The apartment was situated in a prime location and was valued at 70,000 yuan per square meter, amounting to the equivalent of 1 million US dollars. Lai planned to rent out the 55 square meter apartment they were currently living in and move into the new one with her family. However, the property rights for the new apartment were solely in her name. If Xu wanted to move in with them, he was required to pay for the decoration. This stipulation made Xu feel marginalized, as if he had no role in the family's decisions. On top of that, despite his unstable financial condition, he was expected to bear the decoration costs. Part of the reason they received so many apartments as compensation was due to Xu becoming a member of Lai's village after their marriage, as the compensated area was determined by the number of family members. When Xu's son reached marriageable age, Xu suggested gifting him the 110 square meter apartment for his future wedding. However, Lai rejected this idea, 
This dismissal ignited a deep-seated anger within Shu. He felt overlooked by his wife despite years of hard work for the family. He started thinking that if Lai were gone, he and his daughter could live a comfortable life with the remaining assets. On the morning of July 4th, 2020, the couple went to the hospital together. Shu had a dentist appointment, and Lai needed to pick up her regular hypertension medication. After their hospital visit, they returned home for lunch. In the afternoon, Shu went to check on the progress of the new house's decoration. It was their younger daughter's birthday that day, and Lai took her to buy books and cakes. By 5.10 in the afternoon, they were back home, ready to celebrate their daughter's birthday. In the evening, Shu was preparing meatballs for their youngest daughter's birthday. He asked his wife to clean the meat grinder, but Lai accidentally injured her hand on the blade, which sparked an argument between the two. Despite the dispute, they didn't want to ruin their daughter's birthday, so they reconciled and proceeded with the dinner. Shu, often being the one to make peace, did so this time as well. The couple shared a nightly routine of drinking milk before sleep. That particular night, Zhu spiked the milk with sleeping pills which he gave to his wife and daughter. After consuming the milk, the family retired to bed at around 10 o'clock at night. In the early hours of the morning, while Lai was deep in sleep, her husband, Zhu, used a pillow to suffocate her to death. Lai actually sensed danger and called out Shu's name when her face were buried under the pillow. He hesitated for a moment, then continued until she stopped breathing. He sat next to his wife's body for over an hour to make sure she was gone. Then, he moved her body into the bathroom and cut it up using scissors, utility knife, saw, and meat grinder. The parts that could be grounded were washed away in the toilet. The parts that couldn't be grounded were thrown into a nearby trash bin the next day when their daughter was not home. These pieces of trash were later picked up by a waste company and sent to the Tianziling landfill in Hangzhou. Once Xu confessed his crime, the police were determined to find irrefutable evidence. They dispatched nearly 300 officers to the Tianziling landfill to search for Lai's remains. This landfill, situated in the northern outskirts of Hangzhou, is one of two primary waste management sites in the city. It is the main processing site for household waste, which is transported there daily, where it is crushed, neutralized, and then compressed and buried by large machines. During the summer, the landfill handles nearly 10,000 tons of garbage daily. Amidst this mountain of trash, the mission to find Lai's remains was extraordinarily difficult. Despite the scorching heat of over 30 Celsius, hundreds of investigators clad in protective gear sifted through the enormous piles of garbage for several days. Ultimately, their search yielded no results. Before committing the crime, Zhu had purchased four utility knives. He disposed of the one used in the crime. To avoid any chance of the electric saw being discovered, he intentionally destroyed it before discarding it. The meat grinder, which he used to dismember the body, was still present, but it had been meticulously cleaned. From the interior of this machine, the police managed to recover a minuscule piece of human tissue. After analysis, it was confirmed to be lies. However, as Lai had injured her hand on the meat grinder on the day of her demise, it was impossible to establish that the tissue had been left during the dismemberment. Therefore, it could not be used as evidence. Consequently, the small piece of human tissue retrieved from the septic tank earlier became the only remaining clue. However, it had been in the tank for over 10 days, and the hot weather had caused the DNA to degrade. Yet, the police were able to extract mitochondrial DNA from it. By comparing it with the mitochondrial DNA of Lai's daughter, they demonstrated that they were from the same maternal line. None of Lai's relatives lived in that community, and her daughter bore no noticeable injuries. As a result, it was established that the piece of human tissue belonged to Lai. On May 14, 2021, the case was heard in the Second People's Court of Hangzhou. During the trial, Guo Li Shu stated that the sleeping pills found in his home were for the long-term sleep problems he and Lai experienced, and thus, they kept sleeping pills in their house regularly. 
He used this as an argument to suggest that his act was impulsive, with the tools for the crime conveniently at hand. Shu claimed that his actions were a result of long-term mental stress and professed that he suffered from a mental illness, asking for a psychiatric evaluation. The prosecution was not convinced by Shu's narrative. They had amassed a significant amount of evidence suggesting that Shu's act of murdering his wife was not a spur-of-the-moment decision, but rather a premeditated crime. It came to light that Shu had deliberately procured sleeping pills from a friend residing in another city. Moreover, he purchased four utility knives and a saw at the beginning of 2020, signaling that he had contemplated taking his wife's life for some time. His demeanor following the crime was unusually composed, not reminiscent of someone who had committed a heinous act impulsively. He cooperated with the police and even spoke to the media calmly. He fabricated evidence suggesting that Mrs. Lai had eloped with a lover, thereby misleading the police. All these actions indicated meticulous planning and execution, not a hasty decision. His process of killing his wife, dismembering the body, and cleaning the crime scene was carefully orchestrated and methodical. He managed to dismember the body within a few hours, leaving almost no traces of blood. His mental stability throughout did not suggest any mental illness. The court did not immediately pronounce the verdict. However, two months later, Shu Guoli was sentenced to death. Despite his appeal upon receiving the verdict, the outcome of the second trial remained unchanged, leading to his execution on March 21, 2023. Before his execution, Shu bid farewell to his daughter, telling her, Daughter, you are the family's treasure. We hope you grow up quickly. Both your father and mother love you. What was once a joyful family is now left to the daughter alone. Thankfully, Mrs. Lai's eldest daughter, Yu Fong, was willing to care for her half-sister. However, for Yu Fong, accepting a sister who is both the offspring of her mother and shares the blood of the man who ended her mother's life must surely be a mental conflict.